I'm David Tufaro, and I'm the principal of Terranova Ventures, a company I started about 20 years ago. Terranova is named after my father's hometown in southern Italy, um, so I feel some strong Italian-American roots. My father was a concrete mason. He worked on the Empire State Building, so construction is in probably in my, in my blood. So I've been interested in history and historic preservation, say a, a, a good part of my life. Um, and in certainly all my years in Baltimore, I came to Baltimore from the New York area in 1973, and this, I've spent my whole professional life in Baltimore City. And as a volunteer, um, and with friends I've been involved in trying to preserve <clears throat> buildings in Baltimore City. One was the Fava Fruit Building downtown. It was the largest remaining cast iron front building in the city. It was a warehouse, a grocery business. And with a small team of friends who had no experience, no influence, we were able to get the building not saved, but since it had a cast iron front, get get the cast iron front unbolted from the uh, brick and then it was reused and they had to refabricate parts for the city life museums located on president street in baltimore which was a short-lived museum but we we had some efforts uh we had some success with that and i've been involved with other uh, historic preservation efforts in the city I got actively involved with the old Montgomery Ward building on the southwest side of Baltimore City. It was one of about seven of Montgomery Ward's regional centers built in 1925, immediately expanded. It's, a, it's the largest by far building in the, in the Baltimore area. It's a minute and a quarter square feet. And 20 years ago, we, partner and I, acquired it and redeveloped it as office, as office space. More recently, we're sitting at Whitehall Mill in Baltimore City. Uh, this is the second of two former cotton mills that I've been involved with redeveloping. Mill number one is about a half mile downstream along the Jones Falls. These buildings were flour mills or the structures that were on these sites were originally flour mills in the late 18th century. Uh, kind of the same era that Ellicott City got its first flour mill from the Ellicott brothers. And then they were all converted to cotton, cotton duck mills along this stretch of the Jones Falls. And uh, this was the larger, largest production area in the world in cotton duck. And it came out of Baltimore's history with the, with the clipper ships and the sailcloth and our whole industrial revolution that took place in the Baltimore area along the Jones Falls, the Patapsco River as two major areas. So we redeveloped Mill Number One starting around 2014. It's a mixed use project, restaurant, offices, apartments, and a venue space. And here at Whitehall, we've got all those things plus a, a market. So I've gotten to enjoy taking these old buildings and putting them back into use while preserving them. You know, unfortunately, we can't always preserve the original uses. Time has moved on. We don't produce things the same way. And that's the case with the Wilkins Rogers mill today. It was a question of what do you do to preserve this historic building on this historic site where the Ellicott brothers opened the first merchant flour mill in the Baltimore area? And I guess 1774. And then this current building was built in 1916. And the architect I worked for, Charles Alexander's office is located along Main Street in Ellicott City. We talked about if this uh, flour mill relocated its facilities, what could we eventually do with the building? And that's where we've kind of got, gotten to today. So the Wilkins Rogers flour mill, it's interesting, is in total contrast 
and the way it's constructed to the original Ellicott Brothers Mills, which were one, two, and three-story buildings, they were built there to use the water power. And they were designed knowing that they would flood from time to time. And the same is the case with Mill Number no. 1 and Whitehall Mill. All three projects are located in what they call the 100 year floodplain, which means they're prone to some serious flooding. As I said, the original mill owners, whether it be here in the Baltimore area or, or New England or the Midwest, they, when they designed these buildings, they designed them with the intention that they would survive the floods. And there were unpredictable, terrible floods, you know, all over the country. And in the case of the Patapsco River, um, there were numerous floods. 1868 was a really destructive flood. Most of the mill buildings in that, in that specific location were destroyed. 1972 was the Agnes flood, which inundated the really the whole Northeast. I've seen photographs of the Wilkins Rogers Mills taken at the time of the Agnes flood, surrounded by water, so it looked like an island. The buildings, the nine outdoor silos, it literally looked like an island, surrounded by water. When they built this building in 1916, they built it as a poured in place concrete building, so it was not going to be destroyed by any flood, no matter how high it got. There would be damage, potentially, but it would be easily put back in use. And the current owners acquired the building shortly after the flood, the Agnes flood in 72, and opened their, um, their flower operations um, again. They had been a flour mill in 1916, in between, it was a donut machine manufacturing facility. We knew the building would not be de destroyed, but we would have to contend with flooding conditions. How you protect the building, what uses do you put it to. Um, we were, we've developed protections in our codes so that all residences today, if you're doing a building in a floodplain, need to be located above the 100-year floodplain. And the theory behind it is, you know, you're asleep at night and you don't know the water's arising. It could be a flash flood. We know how quickly the water comes up. You need to be deemed safe. As safe as we can. Obviously, if you have enough warning, you probably ought to leave the building. But the point is, if you haven't gotten the warning and you're there, you're going to be safe. The code folks would like to have an emergency means of egress, even though nobody would need, ideally, have to leave the premises in the in a, in a flood but if there were emergency medical crisis there's a way to get you out of the building get taken to a hospital so interestingly enough we're using the old railroad spur bridge which is a steel trestle bridge it comes across the Pataxa River from the Howard County side to the Baltimore County side it's still mostly intact and that we're going to restore that in, in part and use that as an emergency means of egress. And going back in history, when the B&O Railroad built the first commercial railroad in the nation, from Baltimore City out to Ellicott City, right across the river from this property, they negotiated terms with the B&O, the Ellicott brothers, to build a spur back in 1830 across the Patapsco, and it's sometimes called the first railroad spur in the country. Numerous bridges undoubtedly have been built over time because we've seen them in the photographs and the drawings. The current bridge was built sometime after the 1868 flood and before this current building was built in 1916. So fortunately we've got the spur, a means of egress on 
this particular project, Whitehall Mill, we've learned how to protect the building from water coming in. So behind me are windows that are aquarium thick glass and they will withstand flood waters from breaking those windows and keeping the water from coming in the building. We plan to employ some of those same techniques on the Wilkins Rogers project and also behind me there's a um, floodgate, a big aluminum floodgate, metal gate that swings into place to protect the storefront doors which are not made of aquarium glass and, and can't withstand the same water pressure. They are rolled into place or swung into place in order to protect those the doors in the event of a flood. And so we've learned the art of how to do that and make them easily deployed in the event of a, uh, a flood event. We're not going to add to the footprint of the building, so we won't negatively impact the, um, the flow of water on the, on the site. Nowadays, since we've learned more about floods and how to mitigate flooding, we try not to build in the 100-year flood zones, which is a wise approach. We've made exceptions for these historic buildings because they're a valued part of our history and they're often wonderful buildings in and of themselves. So our vision for the project has been primarily to put non-residential uses on the first floor and apartments above. So with that plan, so the building is as high as 110 feet tall on the Frederick Road side. There's a smaller building on the river side. The railroad tracks essentially come if you will, into the building uh, because the, the building built in, constructed in 1916 was built immediately adjacent to those existing railroad tracks to take advantage of the delivery of goods to the, to the property. On our current designs, and we may, may do some further tweaking, but you have to work with the dimensions you've got. So the front building's about 50 feet deep, which is not deep enough for a double loaded corridor, which is typically the way a multifamily building is built or a hotel is built. You have a corridor and you have apartments or hotel rooms on either side of the corridor. We are putting a corridor on the stream side and the doors are off the corridor towards the Frederick Road side. We end up with somewhere around 95 apartments on that portion. The back side is a, the building is lower to make the economies of scale and financing work. We're adding approximately two stories of new construction. That basically is invisible from Frederick Road. It's only visible from the railroad tracks, which are now the CSX lines on the Howard County side. We end up with about 95 units on that side. That building is deeper, so we can do a double loaded corridor. And the new construction will have balconies overlooking the river. There's a concrete deck at the downstream end of the property, which was for mechanical equipment that's now vacant. We plan to make that a restaurant deck, outdoor restaurant deck, and we plan to have a destination restaurant seating about 150 people inside, maybe 40 or 50 seats outside, overlooking the Patapsco River. Um, that should be a, a great draw, both for the residents, but it's gonna have a wider draw. And we hope complement the dining scene in both Ellicott City and Catonsville. On the first level, we've got a lobby. We've got a little bit of store area. 
And at the downstream end, there's a stone structure, the oldest remaining structure on the site. Most of it's covered in some kind of stucco. We plan to re-expose the stone, it's beautiful stonework, and turn that into a small museum for local artifacts from the building, giving memory to the flower production that was done in the current building and historically also you know, coordinate with the Catonsville history. Benjamin Banneker being a nearby resident just up the road in Oella and as well as things from Ellicott City. So we'll work with historical groups and the museums to see what kind of museum would be appropriate. Parking lot, we're actually reducing the amount of paving so we'll have reduced the, what we call impervious paving that won't allow water to penetrate it and the water runs off into the river, which means we'll carve out areas where we have green areas in the parking area, the current parking area. There are nine outdoor silos. There are also indoor, indoor silos that you don't see unless you go in the building. They brought grain there for production and also corn for production. They filled up those silos. Um, we're still trying to figure out what you do with those massive silos that are about 90 feet tall, 24 feet in diameter. We might use one for some water, uh, rainwater containment and, and, and uh, irrigating the property. We have inquiries from breweries, uh, rock climbing. We haven't figured it out. At a minimum, uh, they ought to be attractive visual elements through, you know, special lighting done on the buildings, artwork done on them. We are constrained somewhat since we're doing this as an historic project. We can't make what they call permanent changes to the properties. You can attach things that are removable, but we're doing this as an historic tax credit project. So we're under the um, uh, careful review of the National Park Service and the Maryland Historical Trust. And, we, and those programs are designed to restore buildings like this to as much as possible their original condition and looks using perhaps new materials that are more energy efficient. But we submit very detailed plans to those two agencies. They review them and determine what we what we allowed to do, and they review it during the construction process as well. Naturally, when you uh, change the use of a project, which was we're doing from industrial to in this case, residential. The U parking requirements are different, not necessarily more, but they're different, and traffic patterns are different than they were. One of the things as a developer you learn when you're doing any kind of mixed-use development is the notion of shared parking. At this project, at Whitehall, where we're sitting, we have residents and then we have office users. The, most of the office users are there during the day, most of the residents are out during the day and they cross paths at night. So it allows you to build, rather than a number, building the number of spaces you need for office plus residential, you can assume a good deal of overlap. So for example, our stores would be open during the day. We would not need to build additional parking for those because there'll be a comp, the, the parking spaces that are given up by the residents can be used by patrons of the stores. Basically, you have to design the project because this is a somewhat isolated site for purpose of where you're going to live. You're not going to live here and park somewhere else. So we have to build enough parking spaces to accommodate people living in 190 apartments. And most of these are smaller apartments. So we've got studios, one bedrooms, on these industrial buildings, you high, have high floor to ceiling heights, so you can create lofts in the spaces and you get a lot of square footage and volume out of a space that has a smaller footprint. So we use lofts in the 
they're, they're appealing. They give you a sense of um, um, scale in the building. And if you're in the loft, you have separation from the living area. We've done that on a lot of the units in this in our plans. So when you look at parking ratios, obviously if you have a studio, you're not going to have as many residents as you would in a three bedroom. So the way parking ratios are normally done, they take into account the size. And we've done that. We've used the Urban Land Institute standards and we've calculated or estimated the number of parking spaces that would be required for 190 apartments. The restaurant use, lunch perhaps, and certainly in the evenings. So that is an additive to the parking requirements that you would have for the residents. So we have planned the parking to accommodate that to the extent they even were more successful, you know, with business, you would use valet parking. So you could stack cars if you didn't have adequate parking. We've got to meet our resident requirements. What would happen is if we didn't have enough parking for our residents, we're probably not going to rent as many apartments because people are going to find out it doesn't work for them. The, the concerns of the community about parking, I don't think will turn out to be a problem. They had some precedent with the uh, Oella Mill apartments built, which is embedded in the Oella community. And I think it turned out okay. So. We believe the parking will be okay. The traffic issue, we've done the traffic studies. We usually measure traffic problems during the peak hour. In a project like this, peak hours are going to be in the morning and the evening, primarily for the residents. And the, the, the loads, the, the burdens are placed on locations that are not really close to the site for the most part. They're at um, Rolling Road and Route 40 and Rolling Road and Frederick Road. And, you know, there's kind of a, a balancing problem. Most of that current traffic has been created by development that's occurred over the last 20 years, 50 years. Ellicott City, because of its narrow road, has its own issues. So we don't think we're going to have much impact, but that's, we understand the concerns the community may have. Now, one of the things we're trying to do to improve the traffic flow, or we proposed, we'll have a divided entrance, so it's a wider entrance with a clear entry and exit. We're also proposing adding a extra lane on Frederick Road by the property. So if you're coming down Frederick Road from Catonsville, you can sit in that lane if you're waiting to turn left into the property rather than having a car coming behind you. Those proposals are before the county and the state highway administration now. There's no perfect solution in an old community. You got Oella Avenue, actually you have an historic home, George Ellicott's home that's right at the west Westchester Road entrance that was on the property and was moved, relocated. It was built in 1789 and relocated in 1987. So you can't do anything with that building. It's never a perfect solution, but we think what we proposed should mitigate any issues on, on, the, on the traffic. Um, so I think those, that, those are understandably the major concerns that any community has. They live there, people live there, they, they would like things not to get worse than they are. Uh, one thing we won't do, we won't, because we're renting apartments, mostly smaller units, we won't be generating many, if any, school age children. That's de minimis, and that's always a huge concern. What kind of impact are we gonna have on the public schools in the area? We should have no negative impact.
people are naturally skeptical of, well, first of all, they don't know what a product is going to look like in the end. They don't, they don't all have the ability to envision it. And they have their concerns about how things work out. I really invite them, and I'd be glad to do tours, and my daughter is involved in the project, is actually to get a groups of people, come to Whitehall Mill, where, we're sitting, where I'm sitting now, mill number one, take you on tours, talk through what we've done. We've done many neighborhood historic tours of these projects. And um, it, you engage people in a discussion. They understand why you did things and why you couldn't do other things. And I think in the end, we all end up with a, a kind of a better understanding of the challenges of uh, uh, these historic preservation projects um, and how they fit into a community in, you know, in 2021 versus 150 or 200 years ago when they were initially built. So we would we would welcome those kinds of uh, small groups so we can spend some time with people that have questions.